to introduce our speaker here. So, so far my time at Drive, I've met a lot of people that are passionate about data, but uh, quite honestly, I haven't met anyone who's quite so passionate about the whole data analysis process than uh, Dave right here. And so Dave is a guy who's uh, worked at Microsoft and Redfin in the past. He's currently the, the Senior Solutions and Data Architect at Point Mark, which is a Bellevue-based uh, digital analytics consulting firm. Um, so I hope you're as excited as I am to hear from him. So please welcome him. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, just wanted to start off uh, a little bit about myself, a little bit more. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. I work at uh, Point Mark, so we're a digital consultancy, and uh, we're with some of North America's largest brands on data and analysis problems. Um, before that, I was at Microsoft. I worked with the online properties, uh, MSN and Bing. Then I wanted to knock a couple zeros off the number of people I worked with, so I went over to Redfin. Um, I've worked with very large data sites, uh, petabytes in MapReduce environments, um, down to what I like to think of as the trial size dub bar of SQL Server instances, which is the uh, six month trial version of four gigs, where we were literally sending emails, can I delete this table, are you still using it? Um, and I find data to be just as fascinating at the very large and very small. In fact, very small, you know, you can really get in and, and read the story of the data and allow you to kind of get more, a lot, a lot more people to get deeper. Um, so I really enjoy that. Um, I've also worked with you know, finance departments and HR departments and executives, uh, a lot of different types of data for a lot of different purposes. Um, really enjoy it. And uh, now, oh, the arc of my career I think can be best described as um, SQL Monkey, uh, that was a boss who described me that way, to Big Data Analyst, uh, to Cowboy Software Developer, and then a Data Infrastructure Specialist. And uh, learned some hard one lessons through that arc, and uh, we're going to talk about some of those, about how do you make sure to manage the integrity of your data. And I've often been the person who's been in the meeting and saying at the end of the presentation, uh, how did you get that number? You know, and uh, I don't know, maybe some of you have also been that person. Um, so first I want to talk a little bit about the data lifecycle itself. Um, this is actually a real big passion of mine. I'm going to give it totally short shrift. This could be a presentation unto itself. Um, be very clear about that. But let's start with source data. So um, some data is captured. And you have source data now in a, in a web environment. Uh, this could be your server logs. Uh, it might also be your beacons, your tagging solutions. Um, I've worked with transactional databases. So it's, for, you know, it's, it's being used to power a solution um, that provides services. Um, and then you're taking the data out of that for analysis. Um, and then in a sort of non, uh, in a less sort of engineering focused environment, you might be dealing with uh, forms that are filled out. Um, source data. Now, the source data is stupid. All right, it doesn't know much about itself. And that's why you need to reorganize your stuff into an analytics group. That's what I like to call it. And this is where you're going to apply metadata, establish relationships, um, uh, work out some of the kinks, uh, do conforming of dimensions, merge your data sources. And you really want to have that one analytics group that's going to power all of the analysis and reporting that comes off of it because you want that unified source. Uh, the next thing to do is, uh, is to provide some access off that group. Um, Depending on how that root is, it could be a MapReduce store, it could be a data warehouse, it could be a relational database. Um, not all the analysts, especially BI professionals, are going to have all the skills and tools necessary to access that data as analytics group. So you need to provide some method of access for them to, you know, we were talking about this yesterday actually in, uh, in the Buck's presentation, was you need to meet them where, they, where they're comfortable. Right? So you need to get the data. If people like to work in Excel, you need a process to get that data into Excel so they can record it. So. Doesn't mean that the data should live in Excel. In fact, it means the opposite of that. Um, but but Excel is a great tool. People like to use it. Now and then after that, talking about reporting. Now reporting here, you're not talking about that discovery and exploration that you're talking about when you're dealing with the analytics access area. Um, you're talking about distribution, standardization, and communication. Um, it should be drillable um, by dimension, across dimension, perhaps down to the elemental level. But you're not talking about being able to create relationships at that elemental level the way that you can in your general analytics access or new concepts. It's, it's not quite that. And then below this, we don't have on here, I think of as dashboarding. And this is for high level, on-demand access, executives, non-stakeholders. All right, so now I want to tell a little story about uh, a data life cycle and how this lovely little line doesn't, it isn't exactly how it shows up in real life. So um, when I was working at a company, uh, one of the times I was working at, um, we didn't like, we had a, we had a stack, very similar to this, um, but we didn't like the, comp uh, the uh, compromises that we had to make getting the source data into our analytics group. So we decided to build another. Now the idea was that this one would replace the previous one, but as it turns out, about 80% of what we were doing in the previous one got replaced, so the second one got to live on. And now we have two stacks next to each other. 
Now, you know, it turns out marketing had their own staff. You know, that was a different type. Uh, the data scientists went right to the web logs and built who knows what. Um, at a certain point, uh, PR hired a statistician and an economist, and they had a stack. All right, and then we start talking to each other, right? Oh, hey, you got that data, I got that data, let's get that stuff together. You know, it gets pretty crazy, you know, and eventually, you know, the analysts, they get younger and younger, and they get, you know, really frustrated. <laughs> so, uh, and, and, and for me, one thing that happened at the end of this whole process was, uh, uh, a friend comes to me and says, hey, I have this question about this report. I know you wrote this code originally. I'm like, oh, right, yeah, you know, let's take a look. Well, it turns out it was something off the original staff that I considered defunct. I hadn't even thought about it in two years. It was going to C-level employees on a weekly basis. I mean, I, I mostly looked like that. Um, it turned out it was okay, but these are the sorts of things that happen. That they, they, your data lives on. You know, once you put it out there, um, once you put a poem out there, everybody's going to interpret it in a different way. Uh, and, and your data and your work around data is very similar. Uh, so, in that context, what I want to say is when you're talking about integrity, I'm not talking about automated alerts. Okay, they have their place. They let you know if a process stopped running or a traffic fell off a cliff. Um, but they're not going to help you in this situation where you have so many people from so many different departments making decisions. And that's what this is, in my opinion, that's what, uh, that's what data integrity is really about. It's about the decisions that organizations make around data. Um, great. So, you know, and, and here we are at this intersection of data and people. All right, so start talking about that. Uh, I'd like to start with um, where I often started, which is on an analytics team, with uh, uh, talk about the art of an analytics team and how that develops over time. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll go back up to the top of the stack and we'll talk about dealing with IT or engineering, and then we'll talk a little bit about, you know, taming the beast. Um, great, so the art of an analytics team. You may notice that this arc is a little bit more of a straight line of an analytics team. Um, so this is the straight line of an analytics team. Uh, it'll start where I started. Uh, you know, an analyst, a blob of data, and a question. And for those of you who are technical, when I say blob, I do not mean a binary large object. I mean it's more in the general metaphorical sense of a blob of data. Um, so you get that question, you answer it, people are stoked. A new question comes up, right? Complexity starts to increase. Frustration starts to increase. You know, but you're doing a good job. And they start adding blobs, they start adding analysts. Um, now you're starting to try to work together and let those lines cross each other. Hey, your work, I'm interested in that. Can I integrate that with mine? Starting to get confusing. Things are starting to slow down. Stuff's not adding up. You know, people are working within their silos. Um, and eventually what you have is these different perspectives that don't join all that well. Um, now this might not be a team. You might have analysts uh, dispersed throughout your company and, or your organization. In that case, you actually, I think, have more danger here because you have less chance for those interactions. You have more likelihood that you develop various different perspectives. Um, and, and really, you're not answering questions. You know, you're making a worldview, okay? And at the end of the day, how consistent is your worldview? And if everybody has a slightly different worldview, you're trying to roll that up to the top and make decisions, it becomes very difficult, very confusing. Um, so great, so let's start with a sort of sample example about how things can go. Um, so clients, you know, very simple question. How many clients are we working with? Uh, my vice president of engineering, Bridget Fry, and I often used to joke that, uh, you know, mostly, you know, we count things, and it turns out that counting's pretty hard. Um, uh, <laughs> and we're gonna talk about that a little bit here. How, you know, counting's a little harder than you think. Um, so, you know, when you're, when you're doing this, you're, you're, you've got a question, you know, this means that you're creating and employing logic. Okay, and, then, and I want to focus on three dimensions to this logic I'm going to bring them up. There's value creation. In this case, you know, relatively simple. It's counting. You know, every instance, one. Um, now, attribution. I have a little star next to attribution because this is where the mind, the, the mind's like. Um, you know, you talk about filtering as well. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit first. Filtering, you know, people are going to have slightly different uh, decisions there, but on attribution, like who gets credit? This is contested ground. Uh, so you're going to want to think a lot about that when we talk about creating that worldview and data integrity. Um, great, so, oh, whoops, so we counted up our clients. We're working with 5,788 of them. Woo, analysis happened. Okay, um, and then I just want to mention here, you know, in my opinion, all reporting starts as analysis, even just counting. That's analysis at first, um, figuring out what to filter out, what not to filter out, okay? And then eventually it becomes reporting. So let's add some complexity. Clients can be active in more than one product line or uh, you're working with more than one service line. Um, so you create some new logic, you know, you employ that, you get it out there. Now you've got this report over here, and you can see that it adds to more than 5,788. Once this report goes out, and the question is asked, how many people are you working with? You know, all of a sudden you're asking yourself, who did you ask that question? Which report were they looking at? 
was an analyst with access to the analytics group, that they actually could just count the snake and there, here you are, is it somebody that got this report and they sum that stuff up? You know? So one of the things to think about is that, you know, we talked about that analytics group. You want to make your data accessible across any number of environments to any number of people that need it, but you really need to, to keep that logic uh, constant across segments. And, and you need to know who is, uh, who's using it for what reason. You don't just put that report out there and you're done with it. You need to know like, the, the life cycle, what happens after you give it away as well. Um, so if you have a report and you have that line and you're worried that people are going to sum those, you need to have another line at the bottom that says this is the total number of studies. Can I ask a question? Please. Is, uh, so one of the toughest things that I've ever worked with was when I went to a manufacturing firm and I was doing some data analysis, they wanted to know how much inventory they had. Mm -hmm. And six weeks later, I still didn't have a definition of the word inventory. Yeah. Because in different countries, it's on the shelf, it's inventory. We have to pay for it, so it's not inventory. Yeah. I know in France, it's inventory if you own it. Um, where does the definition of the word client Oh, so the question was about the definition of the word client, and get ready to be happy, because I'm pretty sure, yes, we're going to talk about that here. Uh, all right, so, okay, so these questions of definition, all right, so let's add a little bit more complexity, and we'll get back if I don't answer it here. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, um, we're going to add a little bit more complexity, and, and we're going to say that an analyst creates a new dimension called a client needs segment. Okay, now, it turns out that the customer service department is a very powerful department within this organization, and they only serve high need clients. So now they're filtering their reports down to high need clients. This becomes their new definition of client. Right? So now the next question you have is, how far does their influence spread? Okay, every single time that you make, it, you make decisions, you produce outputs, people get a chance to interpret those, and then they get a chance to influence other people around them. So that's something that you need to think about. And, then, and this is a, the best practice we'll talk about here is, you know, take taxonomy seriously. Okay? These terms are generally, you know, broadly categorical meanings. These are terrible terms. You should never use clients or customers or conversion. I've seen it happen where for you know, three months you're in this meeting, uh, you're, you're in meetings across the country, and all of a sudden you realize, oh my God, we had different definitions of the word confusion through this, uh, conversion through this whole process. Um, you, know, you don't want that to happen. So something like that. There should always have to be an adjective with client or with conversion. Um, and then, and then another, another taxonomy practice would be to think about your groupings of concepts, okay? Do your groupings of concepts, do they apply consistently across contexts? Those are, those are just two general taxonomy. I, I shared an office with a taxonomist for over a year. It's a wonderful experience. I learned a lot of this stuff. So if you can get a taxonomist on your team at a certain point, do so. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, cool. So um, now I want to talk about some pro problems of process, uh, which I call you know logic vetting and logic wobble. So that that new concept of high need client, you know, does it make sense? Does it apply across contexts? You know, a lot of times somebody mails something out. It's a new concept. People get excited about it, and they all just start using it, and then they start to apply it, apply it in different contexts. It's better. Hey, sweet. Well, I'm going to apply it here. Oh, it doesn't quite match up. Uh. Well, you know, go through these processes and try to figure out, you know, how far does it spread? How are we going to implement this before you actually start start promoting it? So, and I think uh, the best practice for this is uh, what I like to think of as a I call the metrics committee. So you want people when new new concepts come down the pipe, new metrics come down the pipe. You want to get together with a core group of people, you know, somebody who manages the data, an analyst. Um, if you have a taxonomist, you want them there, and you want to decide how are we going to categorize these things, how are we going to work with them. And then one of my favorite things, and it's my favorite because it's my least favorite because it was it ruined my life for a long time. <laughs> logic wobble. Okay. <laughs> so the question is, you know, somebody's discovered something. They 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 just oh wait before we move on to that, I want to talk about logic vetting. I want to talk about one more example. Uh, is that within the industry, uh, within the online industry, that really I think logic that didn't get vetted, and that's this concept of the user. So I get it. You know, the business folks want to know how many users are on their website, but the fact of the matter is that we don't have that information. We have information about cookies, and we have information about accounts. And what people do is they come up with all kinds of calculations. And hey, we love coming up with calculations. That's what analysts like doing. Like, hey, I'll merge this into one thing, and we'll call it a user. Well, but it's not really a user. You know, it's a combination of cookies and accounts. And, and it doesn't apply very well. And when things start going crazy in your data, and you're getting your accounts and your cookies linked differently, you miss a lot of these things because you're just kind of users. Uh, I think we're going to come back to that as well. So logic wobble, ruined my life. Okay, so 
Um, your analysts, they're working in whatever environment they like to work on. A uh, very standard environment is that people like to work in Excel, and that's great. But you know, logic doesn't translate well out of Excel. Okay, it's hard. Okay, let me take a look at that if statement. No. Um, so, <laughs> so you start to try to translate to, uh, these to other contexts, and, and, and a lot of times what happens is you'll sit down with somebody and say, hey, I work in SQL, you work in Excel, let's talk about this. Great, I got it, I wrote it down, now I've implemented it. I have it in my code, and you have it in your code. Maybe you change your code, or maybe I change my code. Right? And over time, each of these transformations um, gives you the opportunity to, uh, to, to get a little, bit, uh, a little bit off of each other. And eventually what I think of is like there's a little bit of logic, the wobble in the logic. And when a group of analysts is trying to add things up and make things come together, um, which we always did, we spent a lot of time going line by line being like, why is this one in your set and not in my set? So to avoid that, uh, as a best practice, I want to say that you, you move your logic into shared data structures. As part of your process with the metrics committees, this sort of thing, when you decide this is a concept that we believe in, um, then what you want to do is move that into uh, a shared data structure so that everybody can use it. Great. Um, oh, one thing I forgot to talk about in the beginning, now we're going to move on to the next section, I'd just like to mention, as I've started to talk about this, you have cards in front of you. Um, if, if those of you that are interested and don't mind playing along, if you want to write down a couple things that you think about when you think about data integrity, that would help inform us. I want to know what other people are thinking about, what other ideas that you have to make sure that in the future I can bring these sorts of things. So, and also when we get to the question and answer, it'll give you some things maybe to think about. So great, so now I want to talk about working with engineering. You know? Uh, and when I say engineering, um, I've come from that software development world of working online, so I'm thinking about these software development engineering teams that I've worked with. Um, you may know them as IT. You may also know them as your vendor. So this is, these are the folks I'm talking about when I talk about this here. And the people I'm talking about are the people that control your data lifecycle until you can access the data. So you've got a little thing on the bottom there again with our source data um, and, and the data lifecycle. So, their decisions, you know, until you get access, that general analytics access, and maybe some folks have access to the analytics route, they're making all the calls. Um, and there could be very large downstream effects. I think, I think you probably, I was hinting at this earlier, um, as, you're, as you're developing these things, you're, you talked about developing shared logic structures, these sorts of things, your, your data lifecycle has to change. You need to integrate these in. So there's gonna be these constant iterations working on, this, on your data to make sure that you keep the integrity another reason to be working very closely with IT or engineering or your vendor. Um, that they know this isn't a sweep, we're done kind of situation. It's a look, we need to keep working on this together over time. All right, so I'm gonna talk about some changes that I've seen flow down uh, stream with uh, suboptimal results. So the first bucket um, are changes that, in my opinion, you can blame engineering for. Um, you know, just stuff that happens way upstream that they should have known better to, to not tell you. And stuff that I've seen where cookie sync changes so that whole process, when we were talking about users earlier, of, of, of linking a cookie to an account back and forth, uh, I've seen that change uh, without notice, and you literally end up with a step, a step function in your graphs, and longitudinal, anal longitudinal analysis becomes impossible. Um, and you say, like, great, we just have to wait four more months so we can build up some data. Um, same thing I've seen, uh, so when I talk about naming convention changes, um, I've worked in a lot of different systems. Some were really well set up where everything was done by ID. In other cases, there were a lot of text matching. Um, one day, uh, all the names of the people, uh, the roles got changed in the database. It just came across differently. And we had a, all of our payrolls were set up around you know, what your role was. Well, if people didn't get paid on time that day. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's just say. Uh, so, and then we're we'll talking about logging changes. So someone might simply decide, like, you know, no one uses that. They turn it off. Well, maybe you do use it. Um, and <laughs> now format, same thing that I saw happen with the cookie sync changes where there just became a line where longitudinal analysis became impossible and suddenly we were like, oh, real, we'll get back to you in four months when the data builds up again. Um, in fact, I remember uh, with the format one, I'm talking to my friend who's an engineer about like, well, what can we do about this? And, and he said, well, we can take all of the data that we you know, that we'd previously done and run it through the new process. And at the time, that effectively communicated to me, uh, stop bothering me, it's not going to happen. Um, but what I realized later was, man, they should have done that. <laughs> we should have been part of that conversation. That should have been one of the requirements of, look, great, I'm really excited about all the benefits of this format change. Um, but you cannot stop time and start it over again. Um, but we didn't get a chance to have that conversation. Um, and then you've got that whole human versus system generated values. Um, these things change over time. Um, there are benefits and downsides to both. Um, people forget to put stuff in and you end up with like start dates that are after end dates. 
um, because it's a system day, and then sometimes those switch back and forth, and there's a lot of data quality concerns that you have to deal with around those, um, and you know, it's a big problem. <laughs> now, I think about changes that you should have known were coming, and, and so you know, I mentioned that I was a Cowboy developer for a lot of years, and, and I learned this stuff the hard way, especially these two, um, hacks and piggybacks. So when I think about a hack, I think about something like, well, we don't actually track this, but if this is true, and this is true, and this is true, then it had to have been true, right? Mm -hmm. But changes can happen upstream, and all of a sudden that's not true anymore. And again, people can get paid on time. That was my fault. Um, <laughs> the other one I like to think about are piggybacks, and that is where the data is for somebody else. Well, maybe it's even in one of those other stacks, and what we showed in the beginning, and you're grabbing it for your purposes, and that's great for you for the period of time that, that nothing changes. But then when something changes, are your, are your needs being considered? Probably not. Um, and then I want to talk about the less engineering fo focused scenario, which is changes in the, the forms that feed your data. Um, you know, it used to be one form, now it's a new form, that kind of stuff. Um, so these are the you know, upstream changes that I've seen, which is why it's good to be involved uh, all the way up the chain. All right, so um, I also would like to talk about sort of cultural differences in the teams between engineers and analysts. So one of the big things right at the top, uh, it jumps out at you uh, when you work with people. Um, you know, engineers are very deeply integrated, you know, and that makes a lot of sense because their stuff has to work together. You know, everybody's building their little parts, and it all has to go together. Um, analysts, in general, work in silos. You know, it's about a person, a question, and a room at a corner. You know, um, <laughs> so when we talk, uh, you know, the processes that engineers use, like these are well established and known and accepted throughout most organizations, whereas analytics much earlier in the maturity curve, right? There's not these accepted standards about how things are going to go. Um, and those process requirements really give engineering a, a, a fantastic uh, counter when they're dealing with executives. Like, look, the lights have to be on, it has to work, and we have processes that ensure that that is the case, and you cannot violate that. And executives, by and large, by and large, accept that. Um, you know, the negotiations on the analyst side are much more asymmetrical. And I can think of an example uh, around this, if, um, when I was at a company and we were doing a lot of, uh, so we were trying to experiment with our service model. We weren't sure exactly uh, how we wanted to serve our clients. So we had a whole bunch of different service models running at the same time, different experiments. Um, and, and the way that we were incentivizing people to do these different service models was by paying different bonuses based upon you know, what you had done. So uh, at, at a certain point, we had literally had 10 simultaneous plans running depending on when you started with the client, what product line you were in, et cetera. Um, and I wrote all the code to handle that. Um, it's all SQL code, I love SQL. Seven, seven commands to glory, highly recommend learning SQL. Um, so, uh, you know, when I started talking with uh, Bridget, our engineer, you know, she said to me, you know, who is testing this stuff for you? And I was just like, well, look, you know, there's nobody, nobody understands what I'm doing over here, you know, but I want to assure you that I'm a complete psychopath about making sure that this stuff is locked down. And she said, look, I absolutely believe that you're a psychopath. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's just not good process. And I said, well, great, why don't you help me? And why don't you, you know, why, don't your, why doesn't your team help? Why don't we do code reviews? Whoa, blah, blah, blah. she didn't want to get involved. And I understand why now. I mean, at the time I was frustrated. I was just trying to solve problems. But, but this situation had developed in such a way that engineering couldn't be responsible. Um, there were constant changes going on. There was a war between the people out in the field and the execs in the home offices. When they said these are the rules, and the people said, no way, I'm paying my people this, and I'm sending deal. Um, and there were these constant changes, 10 plans. This had evolved into something that there's no way engineering would manage within their processes, so it had to fall to me. Um, <coughs> great. So, question becomes, how do you play nice? You know, we all want to be riding that bike happy with engineering, um, instead of the two of us on the ground and the bike. Uh, jumble All right, so number one, you know, don't just work together when there are problems. Okay, like you just, you know, it turns out um, a, a hard lesson learned during my cowboy dev days: um, desperation is not attractive. Okay, so <laughs> when you show up, go, oh my god, what are we gonna do? You know, they have a schedule and you're not on it, and you know, they they they're gonna turn a blind eye to you. Um, so one of the things I say is you, you want to learn about their successes, their pain points, and their processes. Um, you need to know what scrum and waterfall mean. You know? And if you don't, go look it up. Um, you want to schedule bridge meetings. You want to figure out who are the people that can talk to each other who are interested in talking to each other. Um, you want to read the release emails. And not just like, okay, but you want to click on some of those links and read the abstracts on specs. And there's going to be terms in there that you don't understand and you need to fight through that. 
Um, and speaking of terms, um, you want to listen to rants around the water cooler. This is one of my favorite ways to learn about people's lives. Okay, so and let me, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you how to identify this opportunity. All right, they get uh, <laughs> the engineer sitting around the water cooler in the kitchen, and they say, "I insert expletive, hate insert technology term." <laughs> Your learning opportunity has begun. Okay, and then again, you know, we've talked about this with code, uh, with uh, code reviews and metrics committees and these sorts of things. Where their processes work, you know, borrow shamelessly, they'll be flattered. All right. So I want to talk about a couple of examples about working together. Um, again, Bridget and I, who I love to death, um, we have very different perspectives, but I love working with them. And uh, so I think rumor has it she felt the same. Uh, so testing scenario. Um, I was involved in a data warehousing project uh, where um, we were uh, coming up with the final uh, strategy on how we're going to do our uh, our three week updates. You know, we were on a Scrum model. There's a little hint on Scrum for those of you who have to look it up. We are on a Scrum model, and every three weeks we are going to be updating. And I said, great, so the last thing we want to do is we want to take the same data set and we want to run it through both the old and the new uh, and, the, and the new code, and we want to basically then take a set of reports and we want to compare those two so we can see what the differences are. And this is what we have been doing on analytics as we shifted from, and we shifted from so many different platforms. I think I rewrote the platform like four times while I was there. And we had always been doing this, but now we're working with engineering. And they looked at me like I was crazy. And on analytics, we're just like, yeah, this is what we need to do. And, um, and, and so I thought about the perspective differences. Now, for engineering, what the problem that they're solving for is that it works every single time. Okay? Nobody's beeper goes off at four in the morning. Okay? You don't get the email from the C-level employee that's at 6 a.m. that says that the data warehouse didn't load today, which we were getting. Um, he was, Scott was great about it, but it was bad. Um, so, <laughs> So, whereas with an, from an analytics perspective, okay, you're trying to solve with the most rigorous precision, okay, and that's and if, if it turns out that it works 95, 98 percent of the time and it fails in a small subset, that's totally acceptable if you have to do some manual work under those sort of circumstances. But that is not acceptable to um, engineering. And so the solution is, you know, I'm a big, I, I love Hegel, so thesis, antithesis, synthesis, synthesis. Um, uh, the solution is that. You know, when the reason that the analysts want to run through um, everything is because they know there's four wonky records in April, and there's another one that causes everything to crash in February, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, that tribal knowledge that you have, you want to translate that, that into use cases, and then you want to work with the testing team. Um, and then data access, and I think this really gets to the core of the problem between analytics and engineering. And that is that as analysts, you know, we just want access. Hey, give us access and we will figure out what's going on. Um, and engineers just like, what are you going to do with that? I don't know. I want access so I can discover. You know, and, 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 and then nothing happens. You know, and this really puts us in a bind as analysts because we don't know what we want to do, but we know we need access. And if your organization isn't at a point where uh, they, you know, they've, uh, uh, sorry, they've, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. Where they, they're not working that way. Um, <laughs> if your organization is not there, you're going to end up in some trouble. Um, so, you know, and one of the things to think about, is, again, is, is let's talk about that, you know, the, they have that really big counter at working with executives. So when you think about when you're asking them to do something for you, that's the context you're asking them to do something in. There's a list of incredibly powerful people that have asked for things from them that they have said no to. And those people are waiting. And now you're in that list. So where do you think you fit in that list? At the bottom. Okay, so... <laughs> First thing you need to do is you need to get some kind of executive support. Right? And then what you want to do is you want to pick a project that has definable endpoints and that ladders into your other large term, long, uh, longer term goals. This way they start to understand what your perspective is, what your needs are. And that's what you ultimately want is that when they're making changes, when they're saying things like, hey, we're changing our cookie sync process, you want them to think, how will that impact analytics? All right, so um, talk about some of the problems, talk about some solutions, um, but I want to just uh, wrap up and talk about Taming the Beast. Um, and here, you know, um, Dennis Quaid and Sean Connery have some stuff to work out. Um, I didn't get all the way to the end of this movie, even though I was a total D&D freak when I was a kid. I just couldn't make it to the end. It was insufferable. But I think where it was headed was that it was Dennis Quaid that had to change, because the Beast was just going to be what it was. And we're going to talk about five. I, yeah, I'll have to take your word for it. Okay. Um, <laughs> there's something about Dennis Quaid that's awesome. Um, okay. <laughs> so, things to think about: uh, transparency, consistency, managing the links between your logic, 
Um, managing access, and I feel a little bad about that, but we'll talk about that further. And then you want to formalize the roles with engineering. Okay, so talking about transparency and consistency. So when we talked about that example, um, the analyst was discovering, you know, was, was uh, developing that client needs uh, segment. Okay, that was happening in a discovery environment, in, in, in Excel, for example. Um, now you need to move it from that, after you've solidified it, you've gone through your code review, you've vetted your logic, you've made sure there's no wobble, right? You want to move that into a transparent state. Okay, so the transparent state will enable distribution and sharing, and it's going to allow for consistency to happen. So, right, I think I'm going to say this many times, I probably have already said it a couple times, move your logic to shared data structures. Like, don't have it be shared code, don't let it live in the code. Alright, so managing links between logic. Okay, so again, once you have all these concepts, do they apply across all of your segments? Do they apply to, across different dimensions? Is it only in this little area that it works? Um, and when you go through this process to try to, to try to figure out how can you apply it in all these different contexts, what often pops up to you is like, oh, we didn't think this through all the way. So make sure you go through that process. Um, you know, and again, as a best practice here, you know, uh, it's a little bit, so again, shared data structures, but just a little bit more information around that. It's that to maintain appropriately grained data structures. So, um, can you see? Great, so managing access. Again, I feel a little dirty saying this, because I've always been the person who had the open door policy, knew it was in the database, sit down with someone for an hour, write them some SQL queries, show them how they can adapt them, send them off on their way. I mean, that's been a big thing that I've done in my life. However, at the, at the same time, I've seen problems. I've seen people add stuff that they couldn't add. I've seen all kinds of crazy stuff come out the other end. Uh, so you need to think about this. So simultaneously, while managing access, you also want to be promoting literacy and working with people. Um, but I want to talk about the different levels of access. Okay, so for a data scientist, you just label it. They'll make all their own calls. Um, you know, in some cases, they're going to look at it and they're going to say, well, this data quality problem, I think, where, they, this, where there aren't data quality problems, it's, very, it's a very small range of, of options, and I think I can predict it, therefore I'm going to do a computed value, and I think my model will be fine. In other cases, they might decide, you know what, I just got to toss every record, every, every user that has a problematic record, I'll toss it. Um, and I also want to say about data scientists, I think you should take the time to get to know data scientists. Okay? Um, they can be hard people to get to know, but they're wonderful folks, and they hold the keys to the future. This is the direction we're going. I want to tell a little story about uh, a big buddy of mine, uh, Dr. Keith. Dr. Keith Herring is the principal data scientist at Redfin, a very good friend of mine. And um, we were traveling for business, and it was me, him, and our boss. And we were back, the two of us were back at our seat, and we were still waiting for our boss to get there. And he didn't want to sit down because it was very important for him for us to have the optimal seating arrangement. <laughs> so while we're sitting there waiting, um, we're just standing there, and I'm looking at the seats, and it occurs to me, and I turn to him and I say, there are three factorial seating options, aren't there? <laughs> uh, at which point, he doesn't look at me and say yes. He looks at me and says, because it's a straight line, what would it be if it was a circle? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I choked on it, I blew it. I answered too fast, I said four. It was n minus one factorial, it was two. Anyway, um, but, like, like so this, this is how these folks think. Get to know them, they're the future. Um, and when I talk about analysts, um, I'm talking about your, your BI professionals. Um, and, and for these folks, they can do a lot of stuff, uh, but you're going to want to apply, I think, standardized filters to your data elements at this point. Okay? Now, you want to give them, when they want, if they have a project that they want to explore filtering options, you want to enable that. But in general, you want to start keeping things together because the work that the analyst does is stuff that you want to roll into that reporting platform. So this is stuff that you want to be standard. Um, operational managers, right? Uh, um, drillable reports to line graphs. So when you're building your reporting system, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but you want basically, you want drillable across dimensions, down through dimensions, ideally you'd like to get to root elements, um, but you're not going to be producing um, new concepts off of those root elements. Um, and some folks, however, can only handle a line graph, and if you give them any numbers, they're going to start adding them and dividing them and multiplying them. Um, and then we talked about executives, and I call it executives separately here because it turns out that they have a big influence on our lives. Um, these folks can range between the analyst level and to pictures only. I've worked with them all. And it's just really important to know who you're dealing with. So you don't give them something that they're going to cause a problem for you and for themselves and for the organization. Um, a little bit, they need to be handled like the rich five-year-old. Um, you know, you're the babysitter, they're the rich five-year-old. So you need to take care of their needs, but they need, they're in charge. Um, all right, so, uh, so your best practice here, you know, and this is the thing, sorry, when I say this, um, you know, we don't have executives that came up through this working with data. They're not used to this sort of stuff. It's not the world that they grew up in. Um, so your likelihood of having an executive who is really comfortable working with data and analysis and consuming it is actually a lot. 
Um, so, but again, you know what I said before, manage that data literacy. Like, understand who can handle what, but at the same time, work towards expanding it. All right, so, you also want to formalize your role versus engineering. Um, analytics versus engineering, my apologies. Um, I like to break this down into abstract versus concrete. So uh, with engineering, you know, it's the testing, the systems management, the implementation, the scheduling and integration, this file going here, this file going there, did it work? Uh, but once you get into that idea space within the data itself, that I believe is where we're talking about more abstract concepts and that's what I would put into the analytics bucket. Um, and I would even put scripting and querying for data there um, because we're the ones who know what the shape needs to be to power the analysis. Now, you know, a great place to partner with engineers um, is to optimize your scripts. Um, but you should be the ones designing them. Again, logical data modeling, taxonomy, the data lifecycle management, so the project you want managed by engineering. But that concept, who's responsible for the data lifecycle, I think that's on All right, let's just summarize some best practices here. Let's go over the stuff that we went over. Uh, prioritize taxonomy and data governance. It shouldn't be no one's fault that two departments had completely different ideas about what a term meant. Um, and if it is no one's fault, then maybe it's your fault, or it's certainly your organization's <laughs> fault. Um, you want to create shared data structures at appropriate grain. Don't be sharing code. This is how your logic gets inconsistent. You get a lot of wobble. Um, you know, manage your logic through metrics committees and code reviews, where you're borrowing from engineers. Um, and you want to plan for your stack to be dynamic. All those changes, those new data structures, the new things you're, you're discovering, the new data sources you're trying to integrate. It's not a, you know, set it up and you're good for two years. It's a, it's a scrum model. Every three weeks you're adding something new. Um, again, you know, just get, get to know your engineers. Um, great. In closing, um, this is a cultural and organizational issue. Um, you want to partner with engineering, your IT or your vendor as deeply as you possibly can. And, and this is what I like to think about is, is you want to manage your data as if it's a product, right? Somebody needs to be responsible for that, um, for, for, for understanding how it works end to end. What are data's needs as it shows up in all the different places and instances and uses that it does? Great, so thank you very much. Um, it's really my pleasure uh, to be here. I uh, heard some, uh, some contact information. I'd love to hear from you both. You know, for business, sure, but for social business, if it's just stuff that you're interested in and I'm interested in and I want to get better at this. Um, I'd love to talk with you. I promise we won't use the word synergies. <laughs> All right, so, and hopefully this presentation should be available as well. So, and I'd love to take some questions now. So, sorry, I was busy tweeting one of your quotes. Can you review for me yeah. the Scrum model? What is oh, so Scrum, yeah, we'll go over Scrum. And, you know, I'm, I'm someone who learns Scrum. Um, well, I guess I have participated in it enough now. So Scrum, the idea is, and I think this is really, the question is uh, Scrum, definition of Scrum model. Um, this is, uh, and, well, I'll give my definition. Um, uh, Scrum is basically that there are three week releases or periodic releases. Like I've worked in three, two, and four week models. Um, and the idea is that you really don't know what you're going to find until you start working on it. So what you try to do is plan in these smaller increments and, and stay very focused around what you can do in three weeks. And then move to the next three weeks and the next three weeks and the next three weeks. And this contrasts with Waterfall, which is the idea of like, yo, it ships on August 1st. Oh. <laughs> Um, and everything has to be done. Um, so that's the, that's the difference there. And really when you think about it, it's kind of fascinating. I remember when I first started thinking about Scrum and I was like, how did they ever get the executives to sign off on, I'll only tell you what I'm doing in the next three weeks. And I think the reason when you think about, how would you get executives to sign off on that? It's because the waterfall model is a disaster. And you just can't plan that far ahead in this context. That's from the Microsoft example. Uh, yeah, I experienced this at Microsoft and Redfin, and so one of the things I thought was fascinating uh, going between Microsoft and Redfin is, is even though I went from working with 90,000 people, you know, and in a division of 2,500 engineers, to working with 20 engineers and two analysts, um, so much stuff was the same. <laughs> so, well, it's good and bad, but it's, it's heartwarming that we're so consistent. Um, anyone else? <laughs> if we want people to be predictable, don't we? If we're working in analytics. Um, anyone else questions? Uh, hmm, well, that's a good one. Good yeah, you know, is it, oh, oh, sorry, oh yeah, thank you. Uh, so the question was, do I have an example of the implementation of a large data structure as a success? Shared. Uh, shared, yeah, shared data structure, thank you. So, you know, um, 
I always, you know, I loved the uh, what we called the Cosmos logs when I worked at Bing. So these were the uh, these were the web logs uh, for primarily for Bing, but for other properties as well. And um, and they really they tracked every single thing that was on the page, um, and who put it there, and where it was, and all kind of, and all these nested JSON objects, right? So an individual record in this context had um, an individual record in this context had between thirty and ninety thousand characters, um, but everything was there. Um, and I loved that. I thought it was the greatest because there was no limits to what I could, what I could pull together. Um, now it turns out the downside to that is access. So out of 20 analysts on the team, I think there were two of us who were capable of getting in there and writing the code to get the data out. Right. So then what you need to do is build, and and, and so it's, eventually it did develop over time into something that I felt was successful, which was we built intermediary layers within that um, within that environment. So not everyone's going to be able to process you know the root level you know at that petabytes of data. So we built intermediate levels, uh, user level aggregates. Uh, oops, I said user, my bad. Cookie level aggregates um, that people could use and that sort of thing. And I think that's one of the keys is, is these layered intermediary layers of access and understanding so that more people can get to the data. Um, and when you build those in, uh, it, it's about filling that space in between. Um, it's not a sharing, it's a sharing those intermediate levels. Exactly. Because everybody Managed to create their, their exactly. Own yes, that is, and that's what so that's what we went through at Microsoft was that you know I started talking to folks and said, hey, well I have this intermediary level I built and I described it and I got an eye roll and said, yeah, I got one too. Yeah, I got one too. Yeah, I got one too. And eventually, what we realized is we started building some collective, and so it was an organic process of us realizing <laughs> like, how to do this. Um, but eventually, I think it came together pretty well in that context. And Redfin was on a really good path as well. In that. But yeah, it's, it's an organic process, and, and you know, it's going to be that, just that whole iteration, and you got, oh crap, we need this now, oh crap, we need this now. And you need to be ready, willing, and able to do that. Anyone else? Just to comment on that, we still use the Cosmos logs for quite a bit. I work at Microsoft. Yes. And we still use that. We also use uh, not only Scrum of the Agile methodologies, but we still use Waterfall where that makes sense. And oh, we still okay. use, in fact, I, I don't think there's a single programming paradigm I've seen in 30 years that we don't use. <laughs> and, and, that, and that was kind of on purpose, and to your point, yeah. there's no single answer. It depends let, let the problem drive the solution rather than say, here's what we're going to do. Yeah. So in certain cases, when I came in, we were using Agile for something and it made no sense, and we switched to Waterfall, and a small project worked great, and then right after that, a larger project, Waterfall would not have worked. We'd never hit it. Yeah. And just, just to recap, that was a comment just saying that, you know, uh, to allow, uh, you know, for the uh, to allow uh, the situation to dictate what your solution is. Um, it might be Scrum, it might be Waterfall, um, and the same thing goes when you're talking about creating your data structures, like your situation. You know, I'm not someone with a lot of formal training. Um, I mean, I've, 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 I've gone back and gotten the formal training, but I just discovered it originally by working with people and being like, what do you need to solve your problem? Um, and going from that context. Right? Um, yeah, one thing that stood out to me was your best practice of moving the logic into the shared data structures. And I interpret that as basically moving your code into the shared data structure to create new metadata. Is that is that kind of a yes? Thing? That's the basic idea. So the question was around uh, you know implementing the uh, implementing uh, logic through shared within shared data structures. And yeah, that's that's exactly it. Is that you're saying okay, we're only going to have this written in one place. And it's going to produce an element that's going to be an indicator that won't change. And if what if what that if what creates that indicator changes, we only have to change it in one place, right? So I don't have to say, oh wait, I have it in my code here. Well, oh, that's right, I reference it in my code here, and you reference it in your code there. It's getting out of that situation and saying there's a single place, and now we know what the answer to that question is. Yes, exactly, upstream. I'm ready to wrap if you are. <laughs> Great. Thank you all so much. <laughs>